so I'm going to give you uh, a uh, a very short intro, uh, and I'll right. read your whole bio, and then uh, uh, although you know if you if there's anything if there's anything you want to fill in, feel free to. But um, so we'll do a very quick intro, and then we'll just get into questions about tech polling. Sounds good. All right. Well, now I'd like to welcome to the show Taylor Barkley, Director of Technology Innovation at the Center for Growth and Opportunity at Utah State University. That's a mouthful. Welcome, Taylor. <laughs> Thanks, Richard. It, it is. I've I've uh, I've said this much when I'm introducing myself at some time at some meetings. Uh, okay, well, you got you got a lot of great people there at the Center for Growth and Opportunity. They poached some of my favorite people from other organizations. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah, like who? Like uh, you know, all sorts of people, talented people uh, in and around Washington D.C. Yeah, uh, that's true. It's a great team. So, here in the show, we like to talk a lot about technology and government policy. You know where uh, those two things come together, and we've had some great guests in the past who uh, like uh, Shoshana Wiseman. Patrick Hedger, Spencer Purnell, uh, people who've walked us through issues like things like content moderation and big tech and antitrust. Um, but those people are mere experts. They're a dime a dozen. I want to know what the average American <laughs> thinks about these issues. That's the heart right. and soul of this country. And uh, and I understand you've been doing some polling. You've been out there polling the public, um, hopefully at a respectful yeah. distance. Uh, tell me, Tell me how that project has been working out. We have the same line of thought that you do, Richard. Uh, we want to know what Americans are thinking about the topics that, you know, frankly, I wake up every day thinking about technology policy issues. And I've learned that that's actually not normal uh, mm -hmm. to uh, most people's uh, day to day. So for the past three years, since July of 2020, the Center for Growth and Opportunity has conducted a tech poll. So we've done five of them. A uh, new one will be coming up later this year. So listeners, uh, stay tuned. And we've asked the same series of questions over the past five uh, surveys. So we have some longitudinal data, some data over time that, uh, on those questions. And then each time we've we've asked new ones, uh, some we've incorporated and asked, you know, uh, the last couple surveys and some we've just done one offs. But I'd say the bulk of the poll has been. Uh, issues, uh, you know, questions having to do with trust, for instance, uh, free speech. Uh, beliefs, but we can get into that uh, in, over the rest of the interview, I guess. So the headline, uh, you know, one of the, the the top results when you, you know, you go to uh, CGO's website and you look at this, one of the the top things is the, the company names, like you said, trust in, in companies, reputation. Um, and that's probably the easiest way, I think, in for a lot of people, because they may not know the details of content moderation policies, but they've heard of all these companies, right? They know what yep. Facebook is. Uh, so, what did you what did you find in terms of corporate reputation and who do we who do we trust online? Well, uh, so there's a, we, there's a difference between the companies. So we asked about most you know major large tech companies, you know, Amazon, Microsoft, Meta, and a few smaller ones like Slack and Zoom, and um, what we found I, is there's a difference between I think commerce companies, I would call them, and social media companies. So generally speaking, trust is lower for social media companies like Meta, TikTok, um, and it's higher for, I think, you know, Amazon, like very consumer fo facing focused. Uh, but we found most surprising in our last iteration of our poll, which was fielded in January, uh, early January of 2023, was that trust actually went up for uh, for the first time in uh, the the course of our polling since 2020, uh, for almost I think every single tech company went up uh, in trust. I think TikTok was the only one to see uh, decrease. Yeah, they decreased by one point. And our sample size is is uh, you know representative sample of the American population. So that was that was like the I think the biggest surprise, and we've sort of puzzled on like why that could be. And I'm really looking forward to our next. Uh, the next iteration of our poll to see, okay, do those numbers stay in the same place as the last one? Was this just a blip? Uh, where will it go? Because uh, we've been in the midst of a, a multi-year tech lash, uh, you know, starting around 20, 2016, 2017, where, uh, you know, I'm sure you and everyone listening and watching kind of feels a similar vibes where 
you know, I, I, the the halcyon days of the the late aughts and early teens when tech companies could do no wrong. You know, there were the hope for democracy, the hope for our future, and then in the middle of the uh, you know the the teen years and the you know 2015, 2017 thereabouts, uh, trust and public perception took a nosedive, and uh, we're still in the midst of that. But so it was interesting to kind of see the rise in trust. And the specific question has to do, you know, do you trust these companies with keeping your data safe? So it has to do with data security primarily. But I think uh, like you know the the trust question I think can can reveal a lot about overall perceptions of these these large tech companies. Yes, and far be it for me to to second guess your methodology, but I, I always wonder how much, when it comes to corporate reputation, how much different different topics feed into this. You know, the same uh, the same single uh, positive or negative impression people have. So, uh, even if your question is specifically, do you trust these big tech companies to keep your your data safe? Uh, I'm sure at least some people in the back of their minds are thinking about other things they've heard about the company and whether they oh, like totally. the company for right. other reasons. Um, right. Like maybe maybe I don't have any particular concern that, you know, Facebook is going to like give away my personal information, but I heard something about them being involved in the elections and maybe Russians were involved yes. and maybe Hillary and Trump were in there, you know. So, they're, you know, maybe that is sort of, you know, subtly coloring if I'm going to say anything positive about them, even if it's not on the exact topic I'm active, asked about. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think um, Amazon, for instance, you know, they think of the data that they they have from me. I mean, there's credit card information, home address, you know, my purchasing history. Like this isn't just, you know, my liking something on Facebook, or, as we would call a, a stated preference. Like Amazon has my revealed preferences. They've they're seeing what I'm purchasing and they aggregate that data too. my search history. Uh, but generally speaking, people trust Amazon more, even though they have many, much more data. And I, th I, I, you know, my personal opinion and theory, that kind of matches maybe with yours and, you know, what are we, what are the stories we're reading about these companies in the, in the press? Uh, what are our friends saying about them? And I, you know, social media companies absolutely have, have had a, uh, a bout of negative coverage, you know, justified and some maybe unjustified. Um, like there haven't been any, you know, I can't recall any, um, you know, significant data breaches, for instance, uh, <laughs> like the federal government has had. <laughs> the federal government is notoriously bad at keeping our, our personal information secure. Well, yeah, that's what I was, I was going to ask. That was my very next question. Um, you know, people, a lot of people express concerns about, you know, big, big companies in general, but of course these days people are mostly focused on tech companies storing their data, including financial data, you know, mm -hmm. and banks, for example, you know, maybe Amazon doesn't have your social security number, uh, but banks certainly do. Right. Um, and and whether that's going to be secure or not, whether they're going to, you know, sell it, sell it on the black market to uh, hackers, those guys yeah. that are wearing hoodies and bent over laptops <laughs> with dark lighting. It's always how you see them in movies. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, but of course, the question is that you've already led into it. What about the government? Federal and state governments have big databases, and they have they have all your information, right? Yeah. Um, shouldn't we be at least as worried about the government having their data when we, we you know we don't really don't really have any choice whether they have it? You know, theoretically, we could not shop on Amazon if we if we wanted if we were that concerned about them not having it. That's correct, and yeah, we we asked uh, we asked. Uh, about trust in government as well. And that's been the consistent set of questions since 2020. And you know, I'm looking at the, you know, kind of distillation numbers here off screen. Um, so, you know, for, let's take federal government, for instance, you know, lowest polling number we had was in November of 2020, where trust in federal government was 19%. So 19% of respondents trusted the federal government. Latest poll, it's up to 27 so, uh, and in, even in 2022, our last poll, it was uh, 22%. So, you know, increase of five points compared to last poll. And then, a, what is that? Uh, bad at math here. Uh, seven plus one, eight, eight points since, you know, it's low point in 2020. Um, and there's, you know, partisan swings too. Uh, we saw a huge flip <laughs> depending on who, which president was in office. Uh, so Republicans had higher trust in government and our first poll and like, uh, July of 2020, uh, you know, Trump was, uh, you know, outbound then. Uh, but uh, then it flipped to Democrats trusting government when Biden was in office. So it can, you know, partisan differences play are at play here. But 
you know, I, it was also state government, local government were also, they also went up in trust in our last poll compared to uh, the, the 2022 fielding. Um, so maybe people are just feeling a little more trust, <laughs> trusting, <laughs> except for TikTok. TikTok yeah. did not increase in trust. Well, this also a question that comes up in broader polls about politics in general that uh, pollsters have been uh, asking for, you know, for decades, you know, trust in government in general, trust in, you know, the president or leadership of Congress or all sorts of different sub subcategories of political leadership. And often when those numbers are low or when they when they face a, you know, sudden drop, whatever, you know, era in American uh, history that has been. Uh, there have always been people lamenting that, saying, oh, isn't it terrible? Trust in government is so low. What can we do about that? How can we turn this around? Uh, to which my response is always, well, maybe trust in government should be low. I mean, yeah. should government have to earn our trust? Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, on the, I'm on the same page there uh, as you, Richard. Um, and I think that's, that's something that maybe is you know parsed out a little bit here. Uh, so, I mean, just looking at the data. So trust in... Trust in the government is higher than TikTok uh, in our last poll in January 2023. Um, but, you know, federal government trust is at 27%. Google was at 40%. Amazon, 47%. Um, and, and to me, it gets down to, you know, who can put me in jail? <laughs> mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, greater levels of scrutiny there. But I think that the track record is, is bad. As I was mentioning before, um, you know, federal government does have a lot of information about us and they're just notoriously bad at keeping it safe. I can think of the uh, office of personnel management hack. I think that was uh, 2015, if I'm remembering correctly, where, mm -hmm. you know, a few hundred thousand social security numbers and information on people who were interviewing for top secret clearances uh, was, was hacked by the Chinese government in all likelihood. Um, and, you know, it was just recently, actually, just this week, uh, a new cyber attack was was uh, brought to light that I haven't fully looked into, but that was against federal agencies, and so it's it's a massive target for I think government, other government bad actors, private bad actors, um, but of course, you know, they do have the the power to put us in prison to tax us, and I think we should be appropriately cautious about what we what data we provide to the federal government. So our trust should be should be at least checked and judicious in that area. Well, yeah, obviously for excuse me for people who are concerned about this from a national security perspective, it it matters a lot who is doing the hacking. Uh, you know, whether it is uh, the Chinese Communist Party's Red Panda elite hacking team, or whether it is like some fifteen year old at a cafe yes. in Eastern Europe. Um, yes. But as far as us as normal consumers is concerned. It, it almost doesn't matter right like yeah if, that's true if your if your personal information your financial information your social security gets leaked and it's on some like dark web spreadsheet that someone can buy you know i don't i don't know that i personally care who did it the point is it's not, not secure uh so the you know the problem with you know government databases more than some of these other ones is that they're they're so huge, they're so comprehensive, and there's such a sort of, like you said, there, uh, a uh, aggregating all of that in one place makes it a bigger prize. It's sort of a bigger yes. hotpot, right? Why why yep. hack a database with only a thousand people in it when you can hack one with forty million people in it? Um, and so, so like I said, I think we should be. It seems to be we should be holding the federal government uh, at, at at least, if not significantly more, uh, to a higher standard than uh, a lot of these. A lot of tech companies who, you know, they have a comprehensive yes. view of the things you've liked, but yep. that's maybe not as worrisome as what is in a government database. Exactly. And, I, you know, one other thing I'll note on on the levels of trust for government and our polling, you know, it, our polling took place in the midst of COVID uh, for the most part. So it started you know, in July 2020 uh, mm -hmm. in the heat of heat of COVID. And then our most recent one was January 2023 when it felt like we were finally starting to come out of it. So, um It'd be interesting to see what happens in our next poll, uh, what levels of trust are for state, local, federal government. Um, but it, it could continue to increase just because I, I mean, my one of my theories in this next poll will maybe like validate that or not, uh, is that, you know, government performance during COVID played a lot into levels of trust. So when we look at these general opinions about things, whether it's the, your, your trust in companies or the government or, or some of these other issues, do 
what kind of breakdowns do we see below that? So you've already mentioned uh, hmm. partisanship. So mm -hmm. generally Republicans trust the government more when a Republican's president and a Democrat trust Democrats trust the government more when a Democrat is president. Not terribly surprising. Does it break yep. down by like men versus women or by age groups? Yeah. So, I mean, there, there are a number of questions that we ask in the poll. Um, you know, like one of the, the age breakdowns we found uh, most interesting was the question, most news coverage is good for American society. We've asked that one uh, over the course of the last few years. And there's a, a pretty, uh, you know, there's an age breakdown there, you know, agree 18 to 29 year olds agree at 49% and 45 to 64 year olds, 38% uh, agree with the the notion that most news coverage is good for American society. Uh, we found a huge difference in trust on uh, for TikTok between ages. Uh, so the 65 plus category was much, much more distrustful uh, towards TikTok than than the younger ages. And, you know, you could probably intuit that. But, you know, the, the, the data in our survey at least kind of supports the intuition that, you know, younger users using TikTok more will probably trust it more than older users. And that distrust, you know, went up for the 65 plus age bracket quite a bit over the last couple of years, you know, as we saw more and more stories and scrutiny from policymakers towards TikTok. Um, so those were those were a couple uh, demographics, you know, age age wise. Um, education level also was another interesting, uh, you know, demographic marker. Uh, generally speaking, uh, higher educated populations were more distrustful uh, and lower education and some topics is kind of a parabolic curve where like lower education matched higher education with like the middle being a little more trustworthy, uh, towards, you know, tech or government. Um, so those are the, the few of like the demographic breakdowns that really jumped out to me the most. That's interesting that, uh, you know, the people who, when it comes to TikTok, for example, perhaps the, the most controversial of the social media platforms, yeah. at least in the past several uh, months here in Washington, uh, the people who have the most experience with it trust it the most. Uh, and then the people who have the least familiarity with it <laughs> True. Uh, trust it the least. And I, you know, I don't know, you know, older Americans, is it, I mean, do they have, do they have real legitimate security concerns or do they just not have any sick dance moves? Do they just, <laughs> do they just don't have the content? So they <laughs> I don't know. I'm it, just saying maybe if you're 65 it all comes years back older, to dancing. maybe you should get on TikTok. Maybe you should, maybe you should throw down. People would like that. Um, well, I mean, you, you actually, you know, it's a funny riff here, but I, I agree that it is important, I think, for any any technology policy issue is to get real hands on experience with it. Um, I mean, there was uh, I think it a few of like the TikTok TikTok challenge videos that have been uh, receiving like local media coverage, even national media coverage, you know, like in a panicked way. Oh, look what the kids are doing. Some of them have been found to be completely false. I think it was the like it was like slap a teacher day or something. <laughs> Uh, that took some TikTok challenge that everyone was like losing their minds over. And it turned out to be the story that originated on a Facebook group. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it wasn't even on TikTok. And, but then it kind of ginned up into this, you know, moral panic and this panic about the, you know, what the kids are doing, but it wasn't even a TikTok challenge. And maybe it was made a TikTok challenge because it originated with uh, this Facebook group that seemed to be composed mostly of, you know, parents concerned about, you know, what their local school district was doing or not doing. Um there was a reply all podcast episode about this that I found fascinating, kind of deep, doing a deep dive. So, but you know, for any any new tech tech policy issue, uh, I think it's important to not just read mainstream news stories about it, but to try it out for yourself. I and mean, most of these things are free to check out. Um, and if you know you're not willing to do it yourself, you know, talk to the people who are using it. You know, I was I was earlier this week I was on a Cato panel talking about um, online safety for minors and kids, and uh, you know, they're my recommendation, the recommendation to the other, other experts is to, you know, ask the kids in your life and teenagers in your life, like, what games are you playing? Why do you find it interesting? Who are you interacting with? And I think so often the approach is to just come in, you know, hard and fast with rules and, and, uh, and storylines that kind of fit our own priors instead of, you know, figuring out what actually is happening. Yeah. I think it's, you know, surprising to the extent that, uh, parents, well, Older Americans in general, but even parents with their own kids, uh, don't seem to be that familiar with mm -hmm. what they're watching or what any of the like uh, trends are. You know, they they might 
make sure that they don't like sneak into an R-rated movie. But it, when it comes to like the details of anything, uh, you know, what they're watching, they seem to be sort of surprised by. I remember uh, reading a guy on uh, Twitter who was just like baffled by the idea that his son, who was I think maybe twelve, was like inviting him to come watch, uh, come watch a video online, and it was on it was on YouTube. But he was watching a like a let's play video game. Ah. Uh. Of you know some famous streamer, uh, uh -huh. and his dad was like, "Wait, so you want me to sit down with you and watch a forty-minute video of someone else playing a video game neither of us have ever played?" Yes, and it was just completely baffling to him. <laughs> but it's but something. It, it's a huge industry, watched. right? Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, here we are, you know, doing this podcast. It has this, you know, the video format, which is which is great. But that's that's a it's a large industry. You know, Twitch whole platforms are devoted to this, and I think. Um, you know, it's how PewDiePie rose to fame and then infamy. Um, but their people make their living off of, off of doing that. And it's, it, it can be, you know, and this is the <laughs> tale as old as time as, you know, older generations, not understanding what the newer generations are doing. And I think it takes kind of that, it takes some humility. It takes some patience. It takes some being willing to get into like, what the heck is going on here? This is really weird, but then doing it anyway. Uh, yeah. It I think that that really is a, a tale as old as time. I mean, can you can imagine going back and saying like, "Oh my God, can you believe what the kids are painting on cave walls these days?" <laughs> when I when I was a kid, we painted real stuff on cave walls. Exactly. This, stuff, this doesn't even look like a mammoth. That's not even a mastodon. What is it? Exactly. Is it? And they're they're adding color. Are you kidding me? This is gonna <laughs> this is gonna change everything. Uh, but yeah, actually, there there has been some some polling of of kids of teenagers. Um, uh, interesting potential online childhood privacy issue there i'm not how sure i'm not I mean, mm. it would be tough to be uh being a, a full-time pollster pulling uh pulling kids um but <laughs> yes uh in polls of uh young americans say between you know 12 and 18 uh when you ask them what they would like to be uh when mm. they grow up you know what kind of job they would like as an adult uh, uh an astonishing number have volunteered like youtuber or like online influencer social media influencer sure or yeah. some version of that um, even to the point of being that, that being the top response. Yeah. 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 I've seen uh, some, which I think yeah. is sort of uh, confused or maybe alarmed a lot of adults, including parents, uh, you know, out, you know, civil rights activist out astronaut, forget it. <laughs> Fireman who rescues puppies. No time for it. We want to, we want to be kids. They want to be on YouTube. They want to be on Instagram. They want to be mm -hmm. on TikTok. Um, and, that one doesn't seem like a real job to a lot of adults. Um, True, uh, it does to me. Uh, but um, yeah. but it also it also seems, I think, to some to some adults, like it's it's oversharing, overexposing, mm -hmm. and it's the kind of thing that they are are worried about their kids putting too much information, too much personal information out yeah. online and that that's the idea that that's what they would like that their whole job their career to be i think makes them wonder well what well, what kind of stuff are they putting out now right <laughs> if, yeah if being a sort of you know the you know the most critical uh way to talk about this is like oh well you're a professional exhibitionist if you're out there being a social media you know it's just it's you <laughs> and your life and the details of your life uh, on the uh -huh. uh, everywhere all the time you're the content um if that's if that's what kids think their future is going to be i think parents reasonably are concerned with well how much you know how many personal details are they throwing out there already yeah yeah i i have you know I, it is an inter the reaction to that question i have also I've puzzled over it a bit too like why and like what's legitimate what's not um you know to start like it's it's the modern media ecosystem so you know kids are you know <laughs> i have i have two young young boys uh and they're just you know oldest is four and he's he's just baffled by commercials like doesn't understand like we don't even have cable we don't watch broadcast tv he's just baffled anytime a commercial comes up and like you know a live sports streaming thing that we watch um so this is their media ecosystem so i think you know they want to be like their heroes their stars and it's it's just the gulf between it's you know the, the, so much of like mainstream media pays attention to i think traditional media stars you know like you know tucker carlson or you know anchor of whatever network news is out there and the ratings like how many millions are watching but you look at you know the few hundred million subscribers to mr beast and to any other you know youtuber on down the line it's you know easily surpasses the viewership of 
uh, mainstream news icons. And I think there's this gulf, I think generational gulf and uh, between, you know, younger populations, older populations who are, you know, in the media ecosystem versus, you know, the younger ones who are con consuming. And of course, the second component is like they have this broadcast tool in their pocket, the smartphone, they have laptops and they have the internet so they can be a TV star, if you will, as opposed to a child, you know, even 20 years ago would have had to go through main <laughs> mainstream media gatekeepers to, to broadcast to the world. Um, and I, I made the last point, just kind of riffing on this. Uh, it's, it's a really tough job to be an influencer. I mean, you it's, it's stories are not infrequent of uh, streamers, you know, stepping down from burnout because they say like, Oh, I have to do this, you know, 10 hours a day or else I, you know, get a significant drop in subscribers, which has a significant impact on my income. So I have to keep playing and broadcasting, you know, 10, 12 hours a day. And it's just not, you know, seven days a week and it's just not sustainable. So I think we need to figure out some sort of balance between like that and uh, maybe a, 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 a negative intuitive reaction against it. Yeah, I think that that's a really great point about the 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 platform and the the ability of people now especially you know, young people you know they don't they don't have to go past any gatekeepers they don't have to have no, any credentials yeah. there's no uh casting director uh right. if you've you know you've got a webcam you've you've got a show right Get for as long as you want to like you know uh keep keep posting and putting content up um which is something i think we've only sort of barely begun to to reckon with the uh, I agree. Uh, implications of uh, a lot of which i think are good you know some some are probably problematic as well oh yeah uh, but i oh, yeah. you know i remember like when you were saying you know you, you you went back you know 20 years ago it's an entirely different environment i remember when uh when i was a teenager i went to a um this sort of training session that the local uh public access tv cable channel had ah and, yeah uh, and so because it was supposed to be as, as open access as possible uh, you know, if you went through your their like kind of required training, so you kind of figured out uh -huh. how to like do some basic, you know, uh, camera and editing stuff, you could get your own show. Oh, really? Uh, wow. That's still, one of my great regrets. I never had a teenage, uh, my, uh, teen, <laughs> you didn't, you didn't go local, for it, Richard, on local access television. Um, uh, now, now I don't have to because I have YouTube, but, um, exactly. But it was, but you literally, if you, if you had any hope of like seeing your face on on tv if you had anything to say you had you, know, you had a band you wanted to perform you know whatever you know if you want to get on tv like you literally had to go step into a studio with cameras yep. that cost tens of thousands of dollars and uh you know in this because of the sort of complicated and weird way that we've re uh, uh regulated cable tv over the decades we, we ended up in the united states with this cable access concept um yep where it was theoretically possible uh, but still very difficult um, and and very few people actually uh, uh, took uh, took that opportunity up because it was a lot of work. Um, although uh, now now in the best of all possible worlds, you have all the old wacky, uh, you know, <laughs> amateur TV shows from yesteryear. Uh, some of which are now, and you can watch them on YouTube. So, yep, um, that's right. Uh, a, a cavalcade of uh, eccentric and unusual people who uh, <laughs> had a an unheralded but interesting career on uh, local cable access. Um, totally true. So the other big thing I think that uh, uh, we should talk about that's you know mentioned in this poll, but it, you know is also a top issue besides you know kids safety online is uh -huh. content moderation online, yes. and that is really has had a huge change uh, over the past just like year or two. Um, yep. And and actually, my uh, <laughs> I initially had a um, a paper I was writing with my colleague Jessica Mulugin. She's very talented. She writes a lot about Federal Trade Commission and other. Uh, issues but also a lot of tech stuff like this hmm. and we were going to write a paper about all of the twitter uh the like conservative alternatives to twitter right because the idea in that sort of jack dorsey era um the idea was that among a lot of conservative activists certainly was the twitter was unfair to conservatives they were shadow banning them they were unfairly throttling them that they would ban right. a conservative for uh a comment that the equivalent from the other side wouldn't get banned for and, and so forth so uh, we had uh, we had Parler, we had Gab, we had mm -hmm. own Truth Social platform, and then uh, other ones even that weren't there weren't so much Twitter clones, but they were similar. There's something called Codius, which was kind of like a Facebook clone, but also specifically okay. going to be for conservatives. And 
And so we were going to write this paper about all the all these alternatives and all the competition. And um, we were mm. one. We were going to argue one. There is real competition. Yes, you can you can make your own Twitter. Actually, you and several <laughs> companies have done it. So here they are, and there's they're yes. all competing. Um, and I was we were, we were excited to like put this paper together. Um, but then Elon Musk bought Twitter, and almost overnight there was no reason to write that right. paper because Twitter was now the conservative Twitter. Right. Right. Uh, and and so all the, a lot of conservatives who were really upset when Twitter banned President Trump's Twitter account after January 6th, I think it was banned on the 8th, 2021, after the riot at the Capitol. Yes. Are now, they now have more followers than ever. You know, Elon Musk is retweeting. You know, I always say, once Elon Musk started retweeting Jordan Peterson, I think the concerns about <laughs> Twitter being anti-conservative were kind of put to rest. So now we're in a totally different, situation the, the situational mm -hmm. politics are different but people's concerns about content moderation haven't gone away they just we've kind of rearranged seats right about yeah who's, who's for and against it so now you have a lot of people on the left democratic right. liberal progressive side saying oh no now they're now they're too <laughs> conservative they're letting in all this bad stuff that we think uh -huh. is you know is goes overboard um and they've let the bad people back you know who got banned before uh so we've We've rearranged the, the the chairs on the deck, but yeah. the 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 ship of people worried about content moderation has not gone away. So what That's is true. the what does the polling say about what are people most worried about? What should what 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 should get banned? What should get allowed? Yeah. So I mean, one uh, meta theme which you hit on is you know with with technology policy issues, how quickly things can change, and I think. A lot of the answer to tech policy challenges and problems we see in the world and, and technology is, ju is just wait. <laughs> you know, things will things will shift sometimes as, as quickly as you said. And we actually did ask a question uh, this poll and then the one prior about Elon Musk uh, purchase of Twitter. The specific question I think was, you know, well, is Elon Musk purchase of Twitter good for the future of social media? And that answer was the exact same. 44 <laughs> percent huh. pre uh it was like i think october or thereabouts 2022 so like the deal had been announced but it wasn't finalized and then this january i think the deal had been finalized so we kind of saw um kind of either side but it was 44 percent with maybe some shift in demographic beliefs here and there and i should say you know maybe I should have said this in the front end all this data is on our website if you're into cross tabs, if you're into specific data, maybe you could put this in the show notes. Um, you can look at all this yourself. Um, so any, you know, specific demographic questions and what, who answered what, it's all there. So yeah, on content moderation, um, overall, there's a high degree of trust that Americans have, uh, or I should say, uh, trust isn't another word, but like uh, a belief that social media companies are justified in their content moderation decisions. Uh, so... We even saw some upticks here. I'm, I'm looking off screen just at my numbers so I get them correct. Uh, you know, one uh, one question was, you know, in 2023, 70 percent of Americans agree that social media companies are justified in removing content that they think poses a risk to public health and safety, and that's up uh, five percentage points compared to our poll in 2022. Um, you know, 63 percent of Americans agree that social media companies are justified in removing content they think is disruptive, and that's up. Uh, six points compared to last poll. Um, and we had, you know, our social media companies justified removing elected officials. Uh, that's up by six points, 58% agree. And then, you know, justified in removing users they think are disruptive. That's up five percentage points. Um, you know, one thing that we uh, kind of riffing on that a little bit, you know, we had another question about, you know, do Americans participate uh, in political conversations on social media and the vast majority of Americans said they don't. I think it was only like 20% who said they, you know, you know, participate in political discussions on social media uh, versus a majority of Americans. I think it was around 65% believe that social media is the new public square for political conversations. So this actually led to my colleagues, Chris Koopman and Will Reinhardt uh, writing an op-ed that was, I believe in Newsweek, um, that social media is more like a coliseum than a public square. Mm -hmm. So we have, you know, we all show up to view our favorite, you know, political gladiators and putting that in air quotes, 
uh, fight right. amongst themselves instead of participating ourselves. And, you know, a public square would be something we all have access to. So instead it's, you know, with this minority of Americans saying that they actually do participate, it's, but then majority say they view it as a, you know, public square. It's, it's this select group of maybe uh, influencers, you know, politicians themselves, of course, uh, talking heads, kind of having at it with each other. And we're there to kind of watch it. And it's kind of spectator sport almost mm-hmm. for most Americans, it seems to be. So it's more of a coliseum by our, at least in our polling data. than uh, Yeah, I like that. I read, I read that up and I thought that was a good, really good, uh, oh, good way way of putting it. Um, it's just, you know, I just imagine myself standing there like Russell Crowe, just shouting, are you not entertained <laughs> to all of the people on Twitter? <laughs> um, exactly. Exactly. We do, we do like to, to root for our favorite, uh, I, you know, I was just thinking about this, uh, this morning actually. And, uh, I think some of the people who get, you know, big followings are sort of medium followings. You know, the people with the really big followings are people who are like media celebrities already. Um, right. people who are sort of like, you know, the, the, the 10,000, 50,000, hundred thousand follower people, I feel like mm. they, you find a person who like wants to be kind of edgy and say what you wish you would say, what yeah. was, like, what you want to say, but they're right. more confident about saying it. And so you give them the likes and follows and, and retweets. Um, and they're sort of like your, your, your proxy, um, uh, your champion, you know, like in a, in a medieval duel, like a lady, you know, wouldn't fight herself. She would have her champion fight, fight for her. <laughs> Yeah. And so you yeah. have someone who is the they're they're quick witted, they're uh they're they're edgy, you know, they've got the the hot takes, um, and they're sort of the your pro that you know, they're the proxy for yeah the 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 pundit you wish you were. So then that's why they get the you know, they get the hundred thousand followers, you know, and we just I'm just stuck here with my, you know, two thousand followers. Um, but but not everyone actually wants to be that pundit that gets a right. ton of attention and gets a ton of like questions back and gets a ton of like scrutiny and then you know yeah uh, snarky uh snarky quote tweets harassment maybe mm-hmm. and one one thing i'll I, you know that comes to you know in our analysis of our survey findings you know it's this kind of across the board belief that you know social media companies are justified in content moderation practices even with you know elected officials um is that most proposed modifications to section 230 the law governing platform liability for user generated content uh would really get in the way of all this so it kind of is you know polling and surveying can be a helpful tool to kind of reveal maybe some contradictions um and i think help politicians understand like okay if you go down this this path of amending uh the law that governs content moderation that's going to run up against i think what at least in our polling the majority of americans are are telling us like hey we think social media companies should be involved in you know removing disruptive users uh even in health and safety content you know they're justified in, in getting involved in those sorts of questions which was a huge discussion in, in covid times um and we're still i think you know meta just and the oversight board just came out with uh you know i think reversing maybe some of their covid policies Anyway, like this, I think can inform, I think policymakers and those interested in, you know, bigger reforms, like that would probably potentially go against like what the public is is saying, at least in our survey. All right. This has been a fascinating conversation, uh, Taylor. I feel like we could go all day, but we all have, we all have other work to do. Uh, <laughs> but we'll definitely keep an eye out for the next six month survey. Yeah. Coming out later, uh, later on in the year. And we will we will highlight that when it comes Great. up. But thank Fantastic. you so much for being with us. Thanks, Richard. Great to be on the show.